Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Michael, can you talk us through who are the Stoics, the Essenes, and the Gnostics? Oh yeah, sure. Um, Stoics are an important cult. They, they seem to have started as a philosophy in probably Greece, actually, you know, and then moved into Rome where, where it caught on. Stoicism, I consider myself a Stoic. Uh, it's a very uh, important philosophy. Uh, the philosophy is easy to explain. It just is uh, anything that you don't have direct control of, you don't waste any energy on it. Uh, I, wish, uh, I wish politicians uh, had worked this one out. So it was, a, it was a way to answer the mysteries of the cosmos by some very intelligent people back in Greece and Rome. And the fact is that you're not in control of everything. You're barely in control of your own life or your own thinking. And people like Marcus Aurelius and these other great Stoics just decided that, look, why am I wasting a lot of energy trying to fix things that have nothing to do with me or things I go in to try and fix, but five minutes later, you know, say take a domestic situation, five minutes later, they're back to the, where it was before. And so they thought that why I don't have an, enough life. We, we simply are not given enough lifetime to be embroiled in this, that, and the other, and all the pickles and the, the high maintenance stuff. So Maybe it came from the East. Maybe it was a tradition that was already in the West. It's not clear because there are also Eastern groups like Taoists uh, that uh, have a sort of a stoic you know, uh, tendency. But the, the main thing is it's not really a religion or anything. It's just a way of thought born out of the idea that we have one short life to live and infinite things to know. Something's wrong already there. And then if we keep getting embroiled in things that are going to eat up our time, eat up our mental energy and physical energy, then there's something wrong with that. I wouldn't be able to then have the time to grasp the truth. I, I'm really a disciple of truth. But I, I've discovered that there's an apophatic aspect to this. I must cleanse my life. If the phone is buzzing, if I'm working full time, if I have 2.5 kids and all the chaos and then the rest of the chaos of family and the world and all the palava, isn't it quite obvious that I'm not going to have anything like the mental space and time to work out the greater mysteries of life? And maybe some Stoics thought that's why we get involved in all of that palava is because we don't really want the truth. And we're secretly even maybe we have an antipathy, a secret antipathy to the truth. You know, they were, they were thinking along this lines, those lines. So, hmm, wow, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe there's a choice mechanism going on in which anti-stoical people per, like the clamor of the world and like to have their life eaten up by time. So there's that. Essenes were a oddball group of Jews. That's all. Nothing, nothing mysterious. Some people thought that Jesus might have been in the scene, you know, and that's been chased down. I've read every book. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1948, just about the same time that uh, Israel was founded. It was just a peculiar coincidence. But digs had been done by archaeologists out in Syria, out in Judea. You know, Ralph Ellis uh, would be probably somebody who could speak more about this because he's been out there doing things like that. But he knows that the Essenes were just one of many cults. There was the Mandeans, there were the Ebionites, there were the Nasians, there was the Galileans. Uh, there was the Therapeutae, very important group that is the origins of Christianity. So Judaism, like I said, is split up into enormous, you know, think of the Sadducees and Pharisees. There's one that everyone would know, right? I mean, everyone who's read the Bible, everyone who's gone to Sunday school knows at least two factions of Judaism. But you also know about the Sikari, and you also know about the Zealots. So come on, what does that tell you? There was, and all of them hated each other. The Sadducees and Pharisees couldn't even get along. And that's not even talking about more sinister or, okay, maybe not sinister, but underground Masonic type groups, which, which was in Judaism, absolutely was there in Judaism. We're just talking about, you know, you can open the encyclopedia and look up Judaic cults, Judea, Judaic movements. There was hundreds of them. And many of them contributed to what we call Christianity because the man who created Christianity Josephus Flavius, your St. Paul, who was once Saul, but whose real name was Josephus Flavius, was from a very cosmopolitan city, Tarsus, when he grew up, and therefore was highly informed about all of these different cults. 
His own city's patron was called Apollonius of Tyana, one of the most important mystics who's ever lived. So he came from a cosmopolitan background. As a Jew, he was highly read. He knew about all uh, the cults of Alexandria and of places like Heliopolis, you know, all of this, and brought it all together to make it palatable for the Western audience, which hadn't quite bitten down on the Judaism. Well, he just says so simple, you just create Judaism light. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were dug up, gave scholars the proof that they needed because they had suspected, they had suspected that there was something, you know, a cult that seemed to be unidentified. Let's just put it that way. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they went, oh my goodness, here it is. We found that this cult of the Essenes that lived, you know, outside the temple, way out in the wasteland. They hated the priests and the patriarchs of the Temple of Jerusalem. Just like today, you get the groups that just don't like the hegemony. And so this was a breakaway group that has some very odd traditions and rites of purification, a lot of it taken from Egypt's, the Egyptian ways. And uh, they were a mishmash, but then finally they all martyred themselves, you know, when the, when the Roman troops came out to destroy them. So it's an interesting cult. You have Elaine Pagels, uh, or she's more than the Gnostics, you know, but there's a, yeah, there's a, lots of books on the, uh, I think Barbara Thiering, um, uh, Herschel Shanks. There's even a really good book by, called the Dead Sea Scrolls Deception by Beigend and Lay, which is just brilliant. And of course you have the great, 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 great John Allegro is the man to go to who lost his professional career and job because of the things that he discovered. And one of the things he discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls traditions was the mushroom cult. So there's a tie in then between the mushroom cult as it, as it uh, relates to Christianity and with Judaism. The Essenes were into it. But what John Allegro had discovered was that Jesus, the figure of Jesus, is the mushroom. And the mushroom is Jesus. It was just a personification. So one could chase that up, as I did. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, people can contact me for the relevant books on that. But just get Dead Sea Scrolls Deception and get the works of John Allegro. Of course, they're quite difficult to get because he was completely hinterlanded. Gnostics are a very different thing. And far more interesting far more interesting. They are Christian, but you can have some Jewish Gnostics as well. But it's something that happened more in the Greek empire, which was an empire, took over the world, remember? And so the Romans. So this is when you really looked at Gnosticism as some sort of a highbrow intellectual, uh, later had to be underground, but it wasn't underground in the beginning. It was a well-known cult, well-known ideology. Um, the Nag Hammadi library is another bunch of uh, books that were discovered in the desert, and those are Gnostic. So you can look up Gnostic Gospels, and this is where the Elaine Pagels and Dr. Gillis Crispel and Hans Jonas and a whole line of other people, like I mentioned, uh, come to bear. I've read all their works. In fact, I used to be obsessed with Gnosticism back in the late 80s. I was never a Gnostic myself, thank God, but uh, I was really obsessed with the subject studied everything on it and if people go to unslave.com become a member and type in gnosticism several of, of, of my programs which are the best that's ever been done and it's been synthesized you know from a lot of these great works so gnosticism really is a bizarre ideology with very deep occult roots whether it comes from something in judaism or christianity is hard to say it may be something that even came from their ancestors in terms of egyptian thought Persian thought, whatever. Um, I find finally that in the end, it's not wholesome at all, you know, because of its principles, its edicts, its teaching. Um, <clears throat> but what it basically believes, and of course, there's many innumerable, right? Pista Sophia, look up that book. Uh, and that's only one of many, many. And they even do believe that a lot of Christianity a lot of Jesus' own statements are Gnostic or quasi-Gnostic. As a whole, there's some writers that talk about this. I believe it. Um, I believe that Judaism is, is, is got a lot of Gnostic elements. See, anytime you have a hard split between this world, the world of Terra, the world of the world, of the cosmos, and then a separate supernatural realm inhabited by God, that's already quasi-Gnostic. 
You can't have Gnosticism without that principle. But that principle is found in a lot of different religions. And in the case of Judaism, the Gnostic element would be to accent that because the God that inhabits the uh, supernatural realm is a remote God who doesn't interfere with you. That's why the Jews don't pray. Early Jews didn't pray because it's a God, hey, fuck, I listen to you anyway. So don't, don't be about, he's remote. He's far away. He's in his own realm. And really, there is only sort of an angelology, maybe, you know, by which there's a connection. And Calvin picked up on that and said, God doesn't care about you. You're doomed and damned no matter what. While you're here, you damned sinners, potter about and try to do some good. But it's not gonna, it's not gonna actually change anything. I'm just suggesting that since you have to have something to do while you're on this horrible planet, do some good for your fellow people and for yourself. But don't ever think for a minute that God is gonna credit good acts what, you know, and send you to heaven. So these Judaic elements appeared again in Protestantism, by the way. It's totally legitimate. In other religions, they couldn't. They knew not to spread that dour uh, message because nobody would turn up. So at least the Catholics were smart enough to disguise it and came up with a bit more of a friendly, personal God. Another big joke, right? But each of these guys had to customize their religions, you see. But the Gnostic elements are through and through. I'm going to be doing more work on this down the line. Uh, the Gnostic elements are replete in Christianity, replete in the Acts, replete in the Epistles, and in all of it. St. Paul's words put into the mouth of Jesus, there's a deep Gnosticism there, and it boils down to a, an abiding hatred, either explicit or implicit, of this planet, and of incarnation, of corporeality. And that turns up in a hatred of the earth, of animals, right? Animal means dark soul or evil soul, that's Gnostic. A demonization of women who used to you know, be considered more of the earth because they give birth. You know, we knew that there's the goddess cults and the deification of women, but generally as time passed by, and as we came into the patriarchal religions, there was a demonization of the earth and a demonization of people of the earth. The natural cycle of the woman to give birth seemed to be, you know, this thing that could be construed as false and fallen, and you're just repeating the cycle of necessity. Therefore, you could be demonized. You're too of the earth. And on and on it goes. And by the way, this Gnostic group is still alive. They're more powerful and rich than ever. They constitute some of the richest people who've ever lived on this planet. They're very secret and hidden, but they influence more. You know, I've done an enslaved a thorough and very in-depth. And as I said, I've been studying it since the late 80s. It takes on many forms. Uh, they're behind politics. They're behind the World Economic Forum. Uh, they're behind most of the churches. And also, they're entirely the creators of the New Age movement, this Gnostic group. They're behind feminism and a lot of other weird, they're, up behind, they're up behind the pop icons in Hollywood. One group, one group that have been in the planet, you know, since Egyptian days, but they gained enormous wealth and power. And so, uh, yeah, that's a you know, completely separate study. But Gnosticism always posits the idea that our world is a dark, filthy, rusted, horrible place that basically is considered the cage of the soul. Now, these, these ideas are very attractive to certain types of mind. Sadly, when Christians uh, start waking up to the lie of their religion, the trouble is they may leave the confines of religion, Christianity, but then fall prey to Gnosticism or something similar to that, or fall prey to the New Age movement. There's lots of traps. And so this is a phenomenon that needs to be addressed. I'm glad you did, because you see, you could get tired of Judaism, you could get tired of Christianity for any number of reasons, but the danger is then when you think you're free and you're going along and then you stumble over something like Gnosticism, I go, hey, that sounds more correct. And before you know, you know you're in there wearing the t-shirt. I used to go to Gnostic centers in the Bay Area, uh, not because I was a member, but again, I'm a student and I want to know all about it and also the psychology that drives people to be Gnostics. And so then throughout the planet, throughout the world in the centuries after the fall of Rome, you do get uh, 
Gnostic groups or quasi-Gnostic groups like the Bogomils, the Patarines, the Cathars would be the most famous of those, I suppose. Uh, some of them are goddess cults. They bring women had greater power of authority. Women could be priestesses. They had their own Eucharist. But they all dressed in white, hardly ate more than a couple of leaves, couldn't wait to get out of the planet. This dark, infernal abyss. It's in Christianity, but it's very strong in those other really Gnostic groups. And so this is then what has to be argued. Once you discover what the core of their ideology is, then you can start getting into whether it's true or not, metaphysically, what on earth. How, how would you say, see, they run into problems. If God is the creator of the universe, then how come this planet is evil? So they, they definitely ran into problems, right? How can you at once say that the six days creation is all due to God? And in the book of Solomon, you get praises of the earth and the beauty of the earth is all praised. And there's other anecdotes that show that the earth should be praised and the animals should be cared for. Adam, Adam himself is made caretaker of the animals. <clears throat> so why they call lower demonic soul? Adam didn't create them, God did. So how come the, an animal, the very word animal means evil spirit? Well, something's wrong here. So that's a Gnostic element. And Gnosticism is in here, when you study it really, really deeply, like I've done, you discover that Gnosticism is a very bankrupt philosophy. I don't know how anybody would have, you know, back in Greece and Heliopolis and Alexandria were, you know, in other cities of the West, Persepolis, wherever, wherever Gnostic teachers taught. I'm amazed they got a crowd at all, but there you are, they did. And the reason that they did is because they stole huge bunches of, of knowledge from Hermeticists and other schools, especially Egypt. So the Pista Sophia and other codexes of the Gnostics are filled with elements that don't belong to Gnosticism, but it was a window dressing job par excellence. They knew that they had nothing but this dour, bleak, anti-world, anti-sex, anti-body philosophy. And it wouldn't have, it was toothless. Right? But they cleverly borrowed all sorts of elements from the Celts, from the Arya, especially from Hermeticists, and they brought it all together and, and the bamboozled emperors. You know, it really, it did a, it, they did a beautiful calculated job. And so elements spill over into Christianity, into Islam, into the Baha'i, into Sufism. You know, all of these religions are basically peppered, but unfortunately Christianity is heavily peppered with it. I know, I know people don't like that and they've tried their best to deny it, but no, they can't, the top scholars, these are Christian scholars, people who really know the language. They can easily refute that, as you could if you just read it with educated eyes. It wouldn't take you long. Off world. This planet is a cage of the souls. We don't really need to care for it. It's a, the realm of Satan. So the Gnostics say the same thing. It's the realm of the demiurge, this preposterous cartoon character they had to create. Because, of course, how could you have the creation being of God and then say it's all fallen and evil? Well, a clever man would say it's fallen and evil because the people on it are warlike and ruthless and evil. The people, we have made it rotten. No, the Gnostics don't go for that. We're pure souls locked into the cage of the world, uh, uh, a demon-haunted world, and it's all due to this fallen God, which you do have in Christianity, of course. You have Satan, you have Lucifer, whatever. And so they took that motif, blended it with some other stuff, and came up with the Demiurg. And oh, and his mother, who was meant to be Sophia, wisdom, who turned from wisdom, who turned from God, gave birth to a child that she deified into God. And the two of them then, uh, in order to get away from God and to spite God, uh, created this enormous uh, realm that we're all in. But that doesn't make sense because the Jehovah of the old times was evil himself, far wrathful, brought the deluge. So then you could see that Gnostics will say, oh, wait a minute, Sophia, and, and uh, there's a tradition in Gnosticism that actually sees Sophia and her demiurgic child as good. There's Jews that believe that the God that they broke away from is really, the, is really evil, and that these two created another uh, realm, uh, you know, but it, it became imperfect because of their personal wars between each other. They were cast down. And they were demonized. And that's partly what the, the book of Genesis is trying to tell you secretly. Because, of course, when Adam and Eve leave the garden, there's, there is a world out there. 
this land of Nod or whatever is not by any means unpopulated. So there's all sorts of, you know, but then they had to demonize, oh, it's Lilith, it's it's a realm of uh, demons. So there, this is the mess, the footprint that you can study as a genuine scholar. You can ask these questions and find out this is ludicrous. And that story of Lilith and Adam, you know, uh, trying to mate and one wants to be dominant over the other. I mean, what? See, so the, the mess of it. So Gnosticism is a hodgepodge where once you've said a lie, once you've come up with a, a half truth or a false truth, you have to keep lying. In other words, you have to cover a stupid story with many other stories in this in this nightmare list of nonsense. But it takes a lifetime to go through it because, again, it's decorated with hermetic motifs, many of them attractive and true. Uh, certainly, certainly, we can feel that the world is a prison at times. Certainly, we can think it's bleak and meaningless. And as I said before, you know, we've got one short life to live and infinite things to know. Oh, shake your fists uh, at reality. And, you know, and again, if you happen to be un unfortunate enough to live in poverty or in some other state of degradation, you can easily start imagining that the Gnostics are right and that you're in a cage of the souls. It's a very, very, very attractive. And then you can split into saying, well, then, if that is the case, I'm not going to waste my time decorating the incarceration, which leads to apathy, monasticism. I'm just going to sit under a bush and just wait for it all to end. I have no responsibility to making this place better. Why should I? But then the other voice says, well, then you'll have no Beethovens. Then you'll have no Mozarts. Then you'll have no Handels. I mean, even in church, they play Handel's Messiah and everybody calls it beautiful, right? Well, the Gnostic, oh, what do you want to do? hey, Leonardo, just go back at home and, you know, cobble some shoes. Hey, Cervantes, just go and look after some sheep, mate. It's all a big, dirty prison cell. Is that, That's what a Gnostic believes. The Gnostic secretly believes that every single thing that creates culture is just decoration of the incarceration. So. No Michelangelo's, no Van Gogh's. We just live in a gray goo waiting for the end. This is the Gnostic principle. That's why I had to finally reject it. But I rejected it after studying it, right? You go to the John Allegro's, you go to these great works of people who understood the Aramaic, understood where these elements came from, and you diligently start reading it. And you discover some extraordinary things. Like I said, Judaism is a pastiche of at least five different cultures. Uh, Kabbalah. There's even an argument that Kabbalah is not Jewish. It came from the Greek Empire. There's a book called The Greek Kabbalah by Kieran Barry, what people should read. Proving the point that a very key thing to the Jews, something they hold very, very, very sacred, is actually... Probably not from them at all. It's coming out of the, in fact, the Sibel, the cult of Sibel, very ancient Persian cult. Sibyl and Kabel is the origin of the word Kabbalah. It's a, it, so that means that Kabbalah was a goddess tradition that got appropriated by the patriarchs. So, you know, pick up that book, the Greek Kabbalah, and you'll find out that there's a, something extraordinary in religion, that it is like a patchwork quilt. And the scholar is the one who then wants to find the origin of all of these different pieces that make up the mandala. Some are very holy, actually. When you read the Songs of Solomon and your book of Ecclesiastes, you're reading the highest hermeticism. Do you know that? It's not Christianity. It's not Judaism. Those elements got in there and were left in, you know, when the corpuses were brought together. Some really beautiful stuff was left there. The book of Enoch, the book of Genesis, talking about the fallen angels. There's some really, really, really precious things in there as a corpus, but there's also very, very deadly things. So yeah, definitely encourage people to look into Gnosticism. Look up uh, on the Encyclopedia Nag Hammadi Library, Gnostic Gospels, and make a study of this thing uh, to find out one of the most important hybrids that came out of the ancient times and see if it works for you or not, or you can see the inconsistencies in it. Michael, thank you.